know God's gonna God's gonna act when you're praying. That's gonna be something about hearing your prayer, maybe in a soft voice or whatever. But uh, and uh, thank you, Brother Raymond, for uh, hitting uh, hitting record and getting me a thing of water and me for getting it up there. Um, thank you, Miss Jean, for giving me a 30-minute time period to get all this done. Um, and all I'm going to say to that is, God is good, and He gave me a longer word than that. I think uh, when it was when I practiced it, it was longer than 30 minutes. So, sorry, Miss Jean. Uh, continue to pray for our family. Uh, Miss Amy has got pneumonia and has been out of work for a couple of days. Uh, in fact, they kicked her out of work. She, she pretty, pretty tough old gal, and she, not old. I didn't mean old. Pretty tough girl, young girl, very, very young girl, and uh, and boy, I tell you what, she uh, she was fighting it tooth and nail, and uh, and so whatever she doesn't have, I, I've got. So uh, praise the Lord. Just pray for our family. Uh, they're putting a new roof on my roof. Praise the Lord. Thank you for insurance. And the neighbor who got the roof before me, who told me that I had roof damage and didn't know it. And uh, so uh, that, that's all getting taken care of. And uh, we're starting a new theme. Our theme is, uh, uh, oh, Raymond told me before, family tree and something else. Uh, family tree, family tree, uh, genealogy or a list of, list of, uh, list of people in your family. And, and uh, God just would not release me to preach specifically on that. Uh, however, I can direct you to places in the Bible where it gives you plenty of family trees. Uh, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1. go ahead, start right there. That's a great genealogy right there. And, uh, and there's a specific reason for that genealogy other than other genealogies. So you, uh, you might want to read that one up. I'm, uh, I want to bring to you a, uh, a sermon they call, that that's, I've titled it, A Love for the Bible. Love for the Bible. And since I do have uh, limited time and uh, more word than I probably need, but I'm going to start right on into it. Let's pray actually first. Lord, we just thank you for this time in your, in your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that, uh, that comes into this place and touches each and every one of us, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the, for the word that you've given me, Lord, that uh, um, thank you for not releasing me from it and, uh, and, and that it's, uh, it, it's a word for today, a word for our our congregation, and uh, I just uh, I thank you for all of that, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. A love for the Bible. You know, uh, first off, I've read the Bible. I brought my own uh, uh, object lesson. And I got my object lesson, and when I went looking for my <laughs> when I went looking for my Bible, I couldn't find it. And uh, while I was studying, so I had to pull out the archaeological Bible, which is a big old thing, and. And I couldn't find my favorite little Bible, and, and so I found all seven of the Bibles sitting up there, uh, up here at the church. Apparently, I just I read them and then just leave them up here. But I, I have read the Bible through seven, about seven times. I've listened to it about two times all the way through. Uh, besides that, I've read the New Testament uh, probably three times in other, lang other versions than New King James, New Living Testament, and... Uh, NIV, and only one other time in the Old Testament. Uh, you, you know, it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is God-breathed and used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God, that's me, that's you, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I usually read the Bible once a year. Ever since uh, I got into the Berean and got into our psalm, and I, I decided, you know, if I'm going to be charged with what this says, if I'm going to be charged with what this says, I should know what it says, right? I, I'm not saying don't read anything else, but I should know what's in this Bible. I should, I should have an understanding at least, you know, that, of what I'm going to preach and how I'm going to teach it and, and how it all connects together and stuff like that. And, and because I've been reading it once a year, Every year, I've 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 been doing pretty good with that, except for last year. It was supposed to be my Bible audio year, 
And, um, man, I just love listening to the Bible on, on, on audio when it has, uh, you know, the commentary and the music behind it and all this stuff. And, and, uh, and I was encouraged because Amy and I were driving back and forth to work together. And we got the first disc of Genesis 1 through 20. And we put it in and we listened to it all the way to work. And it was a good 40-minute ride. And, oh, man, it was great. And I went to go put in disc 2 on the way home. And there was a huge rejection. And uh, there, so I never got to listen to the Bible all the way through this, uh, this last year. So I, I was kind of encouraged. And, and, you know, see, I'm not one person that, that I can't, I don't memorize it like Brother Tom and, and uh, you know, Brother uh, Dean Caldwell, who can just, and, uh, you know, and I'm not always that great at getting the golden nugget out of it like Brother Tony or, or Pastor you know, where they, they automatically run to that gold nugget and they have it in their mind and they already know about it. And, you know, I'm not an apologist, but uh, I say a lot of apologies, but I'm not an apologist and I'd love to do that. I'd love to have that much knowledge in me and to be able to, 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 be able to do that. Just me, simple old me, little old me. And uh, I, the, the person who can't stand still or sit still for five minutes and and I have to really, when I read my Bible, I'm serious, I really have to concentrate. Shut the doors behind me, stop the music playing, or hide from the TV sounds. You'll get away from the kids, the dog, the cat. By the way, we got a new cat, thank you. And um, so I was supposed to read it. Uh, this was going to be, like I said, my third time, actually, to read it on the, to listen to it on the CD. And, and uh I, got, I was pretty motivated about it. Now, even though, you know, you got to go through Job's rants and the census of names that I can't even pronounce in numbers. It's the poetry that, to me, doesn't have any rhythm. Songs that don't even have a rhyme. And even for the veteran, even for you guys, for me, I don't know. It, it could be kind of a challenge to read your Bible and, uh, and, 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 and be encouraged while you're reading it. And so I, I am going through this to, to encourage you to do, to see how precious that this amazing Bible is, to just see how, 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 good, how much you can pull out of this and, and to stir up a hunger and a passion in you like there is right in me right now to read this book uh, more and more. And uh, it, you know, I was excited and I went to a friend's house and we were talking about Bible and we were talking about God when, when this happens and after Revelation and, and what is heaven going to be like. And, and I told my friend, I was like, hey, I'm real excited. I'm going to read the Bible in an American Standard Version, an, almost like an English version. It's my first time for doing that. You know, I've read the NIVs and the, and the, and the KJVs and stuff like that. And, and you know, I... I, first off, I encourage you to read the Bible in other versions. If you're a mature Christian, then I'd probably warn you about a couple different versions. But if you're, if you're just getting started and you want to read the English version of it, do it. New, T New Living Testament, that, that floats your boat, do it. Whatever you can read. If it's King James that sticks in your head with those, thousands and these, do it. But whatever you do, just keep reading the Bible and... Anyway, I was shared, shared with my friend. I was like, oh, man, I'm so pumped. I want to, can't, read, can't believe I'm going to get to read this through. And, you know, I'm going to read it in this English version. And I'm going to do it mostly online because they have this chronological version where it goes all the way through chronologically, which I've read it once uh, chronologically. I told somebody the other day I've read the Bible through archaeologically. Archaeologically, yes, sir, I've done that. And uh, of course, no, I haven't. I meant chronologically. But uh, my friend, my friend goes, I don't believe in that. Just bold face, I don't believe in that. Now, I knew what he meant. I, I knew what he was trying to say. I, I knew that, that what in his heart he wasn't saying, I don't believe in reading the Bible. He was saying, I don't believe in, you know, be, it being forced down your throat, being part of an establishment, being part of a... Part of a part of something that makes you do it, and I tried to explain to him a little bit that I wanted to do this. This was my plan. Nobody else, you know, jumped on ship with me. I wasn't doing it with anybody else. It wasn't part of the part of the uh, the, the crowd. I wasn't joining a, a cult to read my Bible or anything like that. You know, I, was he deceived? 
Did somebody come and tell him that all of a sudden the good news was no, not good news anymore? No. He's just got that personality that if you tell him it's white, it's black. If you, if you tell, now he can look at it and say that's white, and you say that's white, then you can agree. But you can't really tell him something. And it's, a, it's, it's in his heart that way. And, and I hate that for him because, you know, we lay preachers, first off, we only get like up here once a month. You know, sometimes Brother Keith gets a couple times, but we, you know, we study for once a month. We maybe as a Sunday school, we as teacher, we we do it for uh, for teaching and stuff, read the Bible in it, but it's still not enough read time. So I didn't fight with him or fuss with him, but frankly, I kind of fear for his soul. I I just not because he won't read the Bible because somebody told him that he had to read the Bible, but because of the attitude. That attitude's going to get him in trouble. To me, that attitude's going to just, you know, and in fact, I even went and talked to pastor about it because it was really, really on my heart. And because I've seen that attitude, I've seen, I'm sorry, I read that attitude in my, my Bible and it, it always gets our hero in trouble. Whoever it is, that, that pride or that, that stubbornness or I'm not going to do it your way, or I don't like the way you're doing things. I, I don't know. I'm just scared about his way of thinking. And, you know, this Bible was written with me in mind. Every, every, every verse, every scripture, it's written with me in mind. And, and, and definitely, as Paul says, as a servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So this Bible was directed by the hand of God, one true God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the very same God who directs our paths of our ancestors with this word, directs us with this word. And God wrote this Bible with the blood of His Son. I know it's hard to see that. As you read through it, though, you will see that scarlet just... um, thread just kind of weave in and out of every chapter weave in and out of every verse and this was this was written for that and and this timeline was written for that time you know for this time to come and and I mean you guys you guys believe what I'm saying right I'm not just I'm not just making this up every knee will bow which means not just us religious crowd even the atheists the agnostics and the rebellious will bow his knee in what the Bible says. We have to believe that, church. We have to believe that what this Bible says is true. It is God's Word. And the Bible says that, that no one will get into heaven without coming to the Lord except through Christ. And you can bank on those words. If they're written in here, you can bank on them. You can, you, it, each and every time that, that uh, you read something in red, just hold on to that. Hold, dig deep into it. Chew on that. If you don't know these things I'm saying, who Christ is or the way to heaven, there's a way to find out. You read the Bible. Pray to God. You'll be saved through, through the, the actual words that pop off the page. You hear how something, you hear how simple that is though, church. I mean, so, we, our religion, our, our, our source isn't hard. We don't have to do anything extra crazy. We don't have to build altars and and put children on them. We don't have to bring the animals to the to the to the altar and and we, we don't have to do all that stuff, the crazy stuff they used to have to do. We just have to believe what this Bible really says. You could read here this love letter from God. It's written, like I said, it's written to you, but it's written to me too. It's written as if I was the only one to ever read it. You you remember when you were young, come on now, you fell in love, and they you would get past those love letters, and you'd you'd unfold them because they were folded into little things that you could play with on your hand, and and you'd open them up and and as you read it, you'd you'd go. Oh, she really loves me. 
or he really loves in poetry, you know, and, and all this stuff. As you read those, as you opened them up and read them, did you just read it once and throw it away? No. You opened that up. You read it. You read it again. You're like, did she really just say that? You smell the, the paper because sometimes mine came smelly. Uh, it, was, it wasn't me. Uh, you really felt the love in your heart from the words that were on the page. The love just poured off of it. Sometimes you even took that love letter to your friend and said, look at what she said. Do you think she really means that? Is that what she's saying? And, and your friend would read it. And, it's pretty obvious. That's what they're saying. And then what happened when, when you, you get those love letters, you put them in your top drawer, you push them all the way to the back so mom can't find them or something. And then what would happen? Another one would come. And you'd read that other one. What happened if there was a delay? One, I don't know. The next day, the love letter didn't come. I'd pull out the one out of the top drawer, and I'd reread that. This is the love letter that you are receiving when you read this Bible. He sent a love letter, and by golly, it is a good one. Of course, I'm going to read that love letter over and over again, and nobody has to tell me how to do it. Nobody has to tell me to do it. I want to do it. I want to hang on every word. I want to hang on every syllable, on every letter. And I want my friends to look at it and say, hey, did, look at what it's saying, how it says it. I want them to, to see how much love is being poured out for me in this Bible. And I don't believe for one second that I would put this love letter down and never pick it up again. I would never put this love letter in my top drawer and never pull it out again. I truly believe that knowing that it's a love letter, I'm going to pull it out and I'm going to read it again and read it again and read it again. And I also believe that no matter what time of year, that there's, there's a season for this Bible. Just like the seasons in our lives that we go through, riches, poverty, sadness, joy, peace, chaos, worship, praise, or maybe lost in the desert of sorrowfulness, there's someone going through something similar in the Bible if you look for it. It's in there. And we can learn from that. We go through so much. This real life is just, it, it bogs us down. But I always, there, there's always a reason to read your Bible, which is the reason that you should always read your Bible. Not just in the good times, not in just the times that everything's going well, but in the bad times too. When we feel good and when you feel bad, His Word is there for you. His Word is faithful. His Word is true. And you may not want to believe it. You may have the devil fight you at the, every turn, but this Bible is God's living Word sent to help us and guide us. I read, so, I read somewhere that reading the Bible and following its advice in our lives is like somebody that's, try, that's overweight trying to be on a diet. If you're overweight and you're trying to be on a diet, you know that eating that seventh plate of vegetables today is the right thing to do. You know that you're supposed to drink 900 gallons of water. But it's tough. It's work. And I know that when you read the Bible, sometimes it's like work. Sometimes you have to resist things. Sometimes you don't do what you want to do. You do what the Lord wants you to do. And sometimes it's like work. It's like you, you, have, you, you have the right idea that you want the peaceful living, you want the godly family, you want the prosperity, and you want everything that comes along with that. But you can't just slap it in the microwave and turn it on and in two minutes have it. You have to read your Bible. It's in there. And it's for that very reason that I've got this heavy heart and a defense for reading the Bible tonight. I couldn't get this message out of my mind. So I had to share it with you guys. And I just wanted to lay down some facts for you first. 99 out of, I'm sorry, uh, this, the this, this, the uh, fact goes nearly 9 out of 10, 88% Americans own a Bible on average. American Bible owners have 4 to 0.4 Bibles in their home. And one quarter of the Bible owners, 25%, or 24%, have six or more. But George Barna, who does a bunch of these surveys, and you can go out to George Barna 
dot com, and you can pull out a, a bunch of surveys on Christendom and stuff, says that he's discovered that people don't have, they have Bibles, but they don't know what it says. 48% could not name the four Gospels. 60 couldn't name even five of the Ten Commandments. You figured do not kill would be top, and they would have got at least one. Americans, they revere the Bible, but by large, they don't know what it says. And because they don't know what it says, they become a nation of biblical illiterates. That's what Barna says. More than three-quarters of Americans, 77%, think that nation's morality is headed downhill. A new survey by American Bible Society says more than half of Americans think the Bible has too little influence on culture that they see in the moral decline. Why? Because they haven't read it. I, you, want, you want to know about morals? You read your Bible. It's got morals in there. It definitely has young, morals in there. It says younger people also seem to be moving away from the Bible. A majority, 57% of those ages 18 to 28, read their Bible less than three times a year. And it's sad to say that Trey used to be the Bible uh, king of uh, JBQ. And learn all those scriptures. If you call him out, he'll tell you a scripture here and there. He doesn't read his Bible anymore. He had to read it for Royal Rangers all the way through sir, uh, up to uh, you know New Testament, Old Testament, and all this stuff. He doesn't read it anymore. I try to be a good example. Have him catch me reading it. He, he, does, he just doesn't need, He's 15. Doesn't want anything to do with it. That's sad. Quick story. A new pastor was asked to teach a young junior high school Sunday school class in absence of the regular teacher. He, saw, he decided to see how much they knew. So he asked them, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? All the boys denied having anything to do with it. And the preacher was appalled by their ignorance. And the next time that they had a meeting with the school board, he told them about his experience. He, was, he, he laments, not one of them knows who knocked down the walls of Jericho. The group was silent until finally one seasoned veteran spoke up. Preacher, this appears to be bothering you quite a lot, but I'll, I've known these boys since they were born, and they're good boys. If they say they don't know who knocked down the wall of Jericho, I believe them. Let's just take some money out of the maintenance fund and build these walls back up for you. It's, just, it's sad commentary of what's really out there. I believe it's not good enough just to read your Bible when you have a message once a month, when you're reading it, to give it away. I mean, you have to read the Bible for you. You must read it for yourself. You learn new things that you can share with the congregation. You can teach those things to others. God shows up in your lesson and makes it real for you so that you can see it, feel it, touch it, and know that whatever God has just shown you, that it's, it's something solid. And when you read the Bible for yourself, you're reading it to fill yourself back up. I heard a pastor say that you're putting, I think it was pastor said it, you're putting change in your pocket. He used to say that. You're putting change in your pocket. And if you keep giving it away and keep giving it away and keep giving it away, soon you'll be empty and nothing to give out and you'll be dry. And when you read the Bible for yourself, it's more in depth. When you know, I read it for a, uh, for a particular class, I'm looking for a particular subject or I'm looking for a particular uh, 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 a scripture. When, I, when I'm trying to remember what's, when somebody contests the Bible, I'm trying to remember something. I'm looking for that particular thing. You need to read the Bible for yourself so it consumes you and consumes you off every page. By the way, there's a gentleman at my work that believes that Paul never met Jesus. When I mentioned about uh, the road to Damascus and how he met him, he goes, oh, that was a vision. He never met Jesus, but he had a vision of Jesus. He said, well, you know, I woke up some, some from visions and, and, and dreams and stuff, nightmares, and they seemed pretty real to me. I said, but I wasn't blinded for three days to prove it or have some, or been told that somebody's going to come help me through my situation. I think it was Ananias, whatever it was, and, uh, and uh, all that. No, Jesus never met with Paul. What says, let me put it like this, but Romans 10.8 says, What saith? The word is nigh thee. It's even in your mouth 
and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. Now, I may be stretching what Paul says here, and you got me thinking about the word in, his, in the mouth and in the heart. And when you get into the word, and it's like you're eating each page. I know that sounds crazy, but you're eating off the pages of the Bible. And at first, you, you take that word in, and you have to chew it. And you chew it, and you chew it into tiny little bits, and you break it down in your mouth. And, and in fact, when you're on a diet, they tell you to chew your food a hundred times before you swallow it. In fact, they suggest this so that you, you lose weight. But if it stays in your mouth longer, it breaks down a little bit more. And as it breaks down, it's easier to get in, it, when it gets into your stomach for it to be broken down even further. But imagine as you're chewing on these concepts, on each and every bite, you're meditating on the Bible. How many times you, you, bit, you bite down? How that texture's changing. Seriously, as you read the Word and you take that bit in, of the Word in your mouth and you ask yourself, what is being said? What is the simple context that the writers were saying? Were they angry? Were they man, woman? And as you chew on it, you, uh, uh, the Word, uh, you place yourself in their situation more and more and you say, yeah, you know what? I could feel that like, like that. What would I feel like as I was lowering my friend down through the roof after I just con got done tearing the thatch off the top? I'd be kind of a little giddy myself. I just got to tear up somebody's house to drop my friend down on a carpet. It just, if, if I... Get back on my point. I would react like that if I was in their, their situation. And if I lived like that and I had their choices, you could see that... As you chew on the word a bit, it makes it easier to swallow. More and more easy to swallow. And it's sweet like honey in your mouth. Once the food is swallowed, it takes a journey to your belly and you can feel the food as it heads down to your stomach. But once it's in the stomach, the acids break it down the word further, taking out the nutrients your body needs. And as you chew on the word, God, now that you've swallowed the word, it's inside you. And unless you decide to vomit it up, unless you decide to put your fingers down your throat and vomit it up, it's in you. Being broken down even more, that word is the nutrients of the body. Pumping through the veins now as pure vitamins and minerals. Going through all parts of the body. The lungs to breathe in that newly discovered revelation of Holy Spirit in the word. To the brain to fire off the synopsis of the long-term memory of the principle that you just read and even in your heart to keep it forever and ever. In your study, you ask yourself not only who was talking, but who was talking in what situation. Not just who was talking, but who were they talking to. How would that person take what they were saying? What are the customs? How would they affect the person's reaction? What were the times that are different than today? You know, by, uh, Paul tells the, the women of the church that there should be silent. That's, he was talking about for that day, they were uneducated. Be silent right now. Learn what you have to learn. Then you can come out and you can start talking about it. Don't just start talking about something that you heard. Wait till you've, you've been taught. There was a different day. It's a different time. It was different, different, different place. And, and, and again, look at the archaeological facts that support the word and that help keep it in your heart. Comparing the word versus word and it, see if it's approved in your study. Meditating on it, absorbing it, and then just memorizing it like the nutrients of food that becomes part of you. It just becomes part of you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That's how close the word is. It's nigh. Joshua 1.8 says that uh, the book of uh, the law shall not depart from your mouth, but shall meditate day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For you will make your ways prosperous, and you'll have good success. What? I read the Word, and there's a promise in there? One of my favorite verses. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but delights in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. And he shall be like a planted a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in the season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Hmm. Whatsoever he does shall prosper. That another promise. You know what? It's the B I B L E for me. 
And it's no Koran, it's no Torah, it's no Tanakh, and it's no Zen tech. It is the Bible. It is stood on its own, beaten and bruised, just like the writer for thousands of years. But it seems that year after year, archaeological studies, uh, other studies come up and they prove the Bible was true. I love watching me a little bit of that history channel. I just could get hooked on that, especially when they push facts and dates against the Bible. And they go, oh, did the Bible hold up against this? And did the Bible hold up against that? And, and you know, when, the, when Israel fought against this war and fought against that war, and they compare it each and every time. I mean, each and every History Channel thing that I've ever watched says that the Bible was true during this time. That they were within like six months or a year of, of whatever this, this king was supposed to be in. Each and every time, the Bible stands on its own, inspired, true Word of God. I'm not saying don't read the other materials. Read the other materials. You've got to compare the knowledge of what you, what you know in the Bible to these, this other Word. And you've got to be able to compare it. Compare it to know that you are approved. Read the stuff in the Torah. Read the stuff in the Quran. Read the stuff in the Tanakh. There's some good stuff there. But compare it to what the Bible says. When I'm reading these words, I am prosperous. And I grow. And I have seen my growth. I have felt my growth. I felt my maturity in the Word. And I, I felt my maturity in, in how I pray for people. It's not just a verse that I may pray that He is able to do exceedingly more. I realize that He is able. He, there is nothing that can hold it back. He is able to do exceedingly more than I could ever think of, ever imagine. i got a great imagination. He can do more than that because He's able to do more than that. I, my, my, my maturity in that has changed. And your maturity as a believer changes. I bring fruit. I feed that fruit to people around me. And even if they don't believe that Paul visited with Jesus on the road to Damascus and discounts the Bible from that point on, I know that it's true. I live it each and every day. I definitely know. Now, quickly, I brought you top ten things to read in your Bible, and it's all taken from Psalms 119. You will be blessed, blessed, happy, fortunate, envied, and undefiled who walk in the order and the conduct of the conversations. We already talked about that, Psalms 119.1. It says, uh, again, and I talked about Joshua 1.8, if you want to be blessed, live according to God's Word. If you want to be blessed, live according to God's Word. If you want to be blessed, live according to God's Word. Number two, God's Word will make you pure. How could a man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to the Word, it says. Psalms 119, 9 and 11. A great preacher, preacher once said, God's Word will keep you from sin. Or, sin will keep you from God's Word. Number three, you will see an amazing and miraculous things. Like children who have never been able to hear before can hear. Like children who had stuff wrong with their ears and they would have to have an operation and they can hear. Like people who have had broken limbs that have been healed. Like cancer that's been healed. You will see miraculous things. I have this written on my closet in pencil. I've told you about it. Open my eyes that I may see the wondrous things of your law. 119.18 God's Word will revive you. Number four. My soul clings to the dust. Remind me, revive me according to your word. Psalms 119.25 You want revival? It's not going to happen unless you read in the word. Unless everybody is leading the word and reading the word and putting it into their hearts. Number five. God's word reveals his love to us. I've already talked about that crimson thread. All the way from the beginning. All the way from Genesis 1.1. All the way to the end of Revelation. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy and loving kindness. Teach us me your statutes. Psalms 119.64. And His Word reveals that love for us. His Word opens up and we can see that love. The love letter. Number six, God's re Word reveals His faithfulness. Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. 
You're, you established the earth and its abides. Psalm 119, 89 through 90. God's faithful. He tried it. He, you could just try and try and try and destroy, to discredit this Bible. And like I told you, watch the History Channel. Dang. Number seven, God's Word gives wisdom and direction. If you've ever read Psalms, if you've ever read Proverbs, how much wisdom is in that? How much wisdom in this? Your word is a lamp to the feet and the light to my path. Psalms 119, 104, and 5. Number eight, God's word is your shield from Satan's fiery darts. How did Jesus defeat the devil? How did he defeat the devil in the wilderness? Swords? Knives? Shields? The word. The word. The word is how he defeated, defeated the devil. It says, uh, 119, 14 through 15, you are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Depart from me, evildoers, that I may observe the commandments of my God. Number nine, God's word will give you great peace. Great peace that for those who love the law, nothing shall be offended. I'm sorry, nothing shall offend them or make them stumble. One, Psalms 119, uh, 165. And one of my favorites is Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Buddy, you can't understand it. Period. Don't try. Don't give it a second thought. You cannot figure it out. It will guard your heart and your minds with Christ Jesus. He'll give you that peace that you're looking for. That peace of God. Number 10. God's Word brings a delight in the longing for salvation. God's Word carries that scholar thread, weaving in and out of every chapter. And as you read the Word, we read promises. Promises that are fulfilled 400 years later, 200 years later. Promises that just they, they couldn't happen by happenstance. And we read those promises, and then we read the promises of protection that He offers us. And in uh, Isaiah 54, Three, five, by his stripes were healed, right? That's a promise. He's promising that. He's promising to protect us. It's a protection of peace, but it's also a protection of salvation. I long for your salvation, O oh Lord, and your law is my delight. I delight in the longing of your salvation. 119, 175. And there's more. Boy, there's just so much more. I had to, I had to really pick and choose to make sure that I, get, I found ten, but I, I could have just kept on going. There's so much in just that chapter. So in closing, I want to challenge you to read your Bibles. Jesus said to those Jews who believe in Him, if you abide in My Word, if you abide in My Word, if you live in My Word, you will be My disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The truth will set you free if you live in my word. An unknown writer wrote this. The, bi the book, the Bible, is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy, it contains the light to direct you. It contains the food to support you and the comfort to cheer you on. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Christ is its grand subject and its good in design. And the glory of God, its end. It shall fill the memory, rule the heart, guide the feet. Read it slowly. Read it frequently. Read it prayfully. It's a mine of wealth. A paradise of glory. A river of pleasure. Follow its precepts and it will lead you to Calvary, to an empty tomb, to a resurrected life in Christ. And yes, to glory itself in eternity. One more thing, Charles Purgeon says, if God has spoken, listen.
If God has recorded his words in a book, search through its pages with a believing heart. If you don't accept it as God's inspired word, I can't invite you to pay any particular attention to it. Just like this man, if he doesn't believe that Jesus and Paul had a conversation, that they met on the road to Damascus, that they, that Paul had something that changed his life and turned him around 180 degrees to go the exact opposite direction that he was going from killing sinners to supporting, uh, I'm sorry, killing Christians to supporting them, uh, to supporting them and giving them and uh, helping them and being the number one missionary that we have. If he says that that's not true, I cannot help him any further. I can give him the good news. It's all I can do. It's all I can do. And if, um, but if you regard this as the book of God, I charge you, as you, as I shall meet you at the judgment seat of Christ, study the Bible daily. Treat not the eternal God with disrespect, but delight in His word. Will you all stand with me in prayer? Lord, we love you. <laughs> We thank you for your word and we praise you for your name and we lift your name on high. Lord, forgive us that we're weak, that we don't, we don't read the Bible, we don't read the word as much as we should, Lord Jesus. And, and we just ask that uh, you push away everything that distracts us in this world, that keeps us from being able to get closer to you, to read your word, to, to find out those, uh, those, those nuggets and to, the, to hear those precepts and to memorize those scriptures, Lord. Help us find those nuggets, those pearls of such value that are in your word. Guide us and direct us in your Holy Spirit. Light that path under our feet, Lord. Be with us as we struggle through the world's temptations. Put a hedge of protection around your faithful, Lord. Around our family and around our friends, Lord. And keep us until we're in your presence again. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you. You can be dismissed.